Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Ulysses Grant, and the focus is world traveler, bankruptcy, and memoirs. The year is 1877, and Grant has just finished his second term as president of the United States, and he was giddy about the prospect of leaving office. He said, I was never so happy in my life as the day I left the White House. I felt like a boy getting out of school. But Grant wasn't just going home to sit around in retirement. He was going to do something he had longed to do, that he loved to do, but hadn't had much time, and that was travel. He wanted to go see the world, starting off in Europe, and eventually he went all the way around the globe. The longest trip of any American president before, during, or after his presidency for any president prior to the invention of the airplane. He got started May of 1877, just a couple of months after leaving office. It was him, his wife Julia, son Jesse, a couple of aides. They got on board the ship, the Indiana, bound for England. There was one other person on this trip, an important one, is a young reporter from the New York Herald by the name of John Young. Young would ingratiate himself to Grant, become a confidant, close uh, source, if you will, on the inside during this entire two-year odyssey. And why was this important? Well, in part because he was sending dispatches back to the United States on a regular basis, kept Grant's name in the news as kind of riveting reading as their former president was traveling around the world. Well, that former president was feted by royalty. He started with the Queen of England. He then saw national treasures all across uh, Europe to begin with, met politicians and businessmen and artists and musicians, and of course, the common man. Everyone wanted to sort of get an opportunity to meet the great American general. But Grant kept saying, you know what? Don't think of me as a military man. This is what he said in Glasgow, where he said, I am called a man of war, but I was never a man of war. Though I entered the army at an early age, I got out of it whenever I found a chance to do so creditably. I was always a man of peace, and I shall continue of that mind. 1878 rolled around, more favorites for Grant. Egypt was one of his absolute favorites based on his own notes. Quite the opposite was Turkey. He decried the repression that he saw in Turkey, particularly against women. Now back home, his son Buck was the one managing all of his investments, and Buck basically said, things are good keep going. So they decided to keep the trip going through the Arabian Sea to India and Thailand, had lengthy stays in Asia, in China and Japan, the latter being the most impressive to Grant, who said the Japanese are altogether the superior people of the East. The changes that have taken place here are more like a dream than a reality. They have a public school system extending over the entire empire, affording facilities for a common school education to every child, male and female. Very impressive to Ulysses Grant. Part of John Young's journey with Grant was something he called his table talk discussions, where he would get Grant talking about areas of interest, sort of aside from the actual travels that they were under. He talked about his presidency. Most people wanted to know, though, more about the war. And he got Grant to open up about some of the generals including Robert E. Lee. According to Grant in one of these table talks, I never ranked Lee as high as some others of the army. I never had as much anxiety when he was in my front as when Joe Johnston was in front. Lee was of slow, conservative, cautious nature, without imagination or humor, always the same with grave indignity. Part of the frank and honest uh, opinions that Grant was known for and would continue when he wrote his own memoirs we'll talk about in a little bit. Well, all of this wrapped up this trip, September of 1879, glorious welcome in the port of San Francisco when the ship, the city of Tokyo, brought Grant and his tiny little entourage in, San Francisco being one of his favorite cities, but he hadn't been there in about a quarter of a century from the first time he was there. He was cheered throughout the city, and all of a sudden, there's talk of politics again. After all, a presidential election is just over a year away. Maybe Grant for a third term. Well, Grant kind of pushed this top topic aside, and he continued his travels throughout the United States on his way back home. He went to Yosemite, then he traveled north to Oregon, back to Galena, his hometown. Huge welcome to Grant when he got back to Chicago, which happened to be the site of the upcoming Republican National Convention. Well, the powerful senator from New York, Roscoe Conkling, was among the leaders looking to get Grant back into office. Now, Conkling was a machine politician. He was all about patronage, handing out jobs, securing that for future elections, and he thought Grant would be favorable for this. So he was all in with Grant. 
There were others in the mix as well. Rutherford Hayes had taken a one-term pledge, so his one term was about to end and he was not going to be in the mix. But you've got Senator James Blaine from Maine, former Speaker of the House, and you've also got Ohio's John Sherman, a senator, who were in the mix. And when everyone gathered into Chicago on that first ballot, Grant actually led, just barely over Blaine, but no one was giving ground to get it to a majority. These three were holding their own sort of day after day in terms of ballot after ballot. Eventually, the, the convention divided on the pro-grant and anti-grant sides of things. The pro-grant side, Conkling and his wing, never wavered. They had about 305 votes on the first ballot and almost identical on the very last ballot. But the rest came to the conclusion they couldn't get their man up to the top, couldn't get to a majority, and they decided the anti-grant feeling overcame and that's where they started to rally around another candidate. On the 33rd ballot, a name came out, a congressman from Ohio, James Garfield. He'd actually just been elected to the U.S. Senate. He's a former union general and he protested because he was there to support John Sherman. He didn't want the nomination. He thought it would be dis discrediting upon him. But that the, the nominating delegates didn't want to hear it. And sure enough, Garfield was, uh, was nominated for the position by the Republicans and he won the presidency. Now, Ulysses Grant, his political career was finally going to be over, but he, and he was quite well off at the time. He had done well in investments, but people still wanted to hear from him. And his friend Mark Twain came to Grant and said, look, why don't you write your memoirs? Other generals have done that. They've made good money. They've gotten good words out there. And Grant said, no, I'm just not that interested. Well, things eventually changed. May of 1884, Grant's son Buck was kind of the money man in the family, and he had entered into a partnership with a young investor by the name of Ferdinand Ward. And the Grant, uh, Grant and Ward uh, partnership actually prospered it's such that Ulysses Grant put his own money, all of his money, into this uh, investment house. And unfortunately, even after getting great returns for a while, it all collapsed. It was a house of cards. It was a Ponzi scheme that Ferdinand Ward was putting forward and the Grant suffered the most. They lost everything. And Grant was mortified by this. He said, I could bear all the pecuniary loss if that was all, but that I could be so long deceived by a man who I had such opportunity to know is humiliating. Grant had this overly trusting nature. It hurt him in his second term as president when he surrounded himself by people he trusted who were eventually involved in corruption during his cabinet and things now finally catching up with him in his personal life. In fact, he admitted it. I have made it the rule of my life to trust a man long after other people gave him up. But I don't see how I can ever trust any human being again. Very difficult time, but Grant was committed to paying off his debts. He was willing to sell everything, including his mementos. Now, one person who came to help was William Sherman. Turns out that Grant had never gotten his military pension. There was no presidential pension at this time. That wouldn't come for more than 50 years. But there were military pensions, but because he went straight from being commanding general to the presidency, he actually never got it. And so Sherman went to Congress to work to ensure that Grant and then Julia, after his passing, would also you know, have some funds coming in. So, so that was helpful, but it certainly wasn't going to be enough to pay off all those debts. And that's when Mark Twain came back again and said, look, let's go publish those memoirs. People will buy this thing. I will publish it in my new publishing house. And Grant agreed. He knew he needed the money. Julia and the family would need the money. And it turned out this would be a race against time. That very summer, Grant bit into a peach and he said, oh my, I think something has stung me from that peach. He took a glass of water, after which he remarked that the water hurt him like liquid fire. Well, Grant didn't go to a doctor right away. He actually waited a few months, waited for his own doctor to get back from Europe. His own doctor then diagnosed cancer. It was not in his throat, actually. It was in the back of his tongue. In either case, it was terminal. Well, Grant now poured everything he had into writing these memoirs. This was all about financial security for his family. He had a little bit of help. His son Fred helped out and Adam Badeau, who had already written a couple of books about Grant and had been one of his aides during the Civil War, Badeau came in and was engaged as well. But Grant did almost all of this writing himself. Got his pad of paper out. He spent a roughly four hours every morning writing out by hand and take a break. He would go and do editing of that work in the afternoon and he would do a day after day, he was in a lot of pain. Eventually, he would even barely be able to speak because of the cancer growing in his back of his tongue, but he persevered to continue to keep 
writing. The New York Times broke the story that Grant was dying in March of 1885, and a lot of visitors then came. And what Grant was most gratified with, they were visitors from both the Union and Confederate sides, both colleagues and sons of colleagues who had known Grant either through their fathers or, or directly through themselves. They saw Grant as a unifying force in the country, and they certainly wanted to pay their last respects. Grant eventually relocated to the Adirondack Mountains, a place called Drexel Cottage at Mount McGregor. It maybe eased the pain a little bit to be in the mountain air, and it helped a little, and it gave him a little bit of a boost to get through those final chapters in the book where he wrote about Cold Harbor, Appomattox. Eventually, he talked about assessments in his final chapter of people like Lincoln and Stanton, Confederates and Union generals. This has been largely regarded as the greatest memoir ever written by a U.S. president. And it has basically been in publication ever since. It was frank, it was sincere, it was insightful, very matter of fact, very plain and easy language, and a lot of strong opinions from Grant. His own sort of no-nonsense, straight to the point. It was compelling reading at the time. It has been compelling reading ever since. It sold 350,000 sets. Two volume, uh, this two-volume uh, memoir sold 350,000 sets in the first printing alone. That netted $450,000 for Julia and the family. Well, Grant got it down to the wire. He did provide that financial security to the family. By the way, the mem memoirs cut at the end of the Civil War. Never got into his presidency or any time after that. He didn't have time, but he did complete from his early life all the way to the end of the Civil War, including some perspective. Well, at this point, Grant knew he was going fast. Final goodbyes, including a final letter to Julia, his wife of 37 years, that he, he, he ended ever so simply. I bid you a final farewell until we meet in another, and I trust, better world. The end came 8 o'clock in the morning, July 23rd, 1885. Grant died at the age of 63. His body was taken by train to West Point first and then to New York City, where a million people or more showed up uh, for his funeral. And Grant, again, Grant would have loved the fact that his pallbearers were former generals from both the Union and the Confederacy. Ulysses Grant, when he died, was in the pantheon for the United States. You had Washington, you had Lincoln, you had Grant. He was that big in terms of his role in the history of the country. A lot of people saw him and Lincoln united to having saved the Union both during the war. They gave Grant a lot of credit for trying to bring the, union, uh, the country together after that war was concluded. He had been a reluctant warrior, didn't really want to get into the military in the first place, and as he said, he left it when he could, but when his country needed him, he answered that call, he won, he fought, and Lincoln said he fights, and that was what was so important to Lincoln, and that's why he kept getting greater responsibility until he became the commanding general that led to the final outcome in the war. Many have criticized his technique, maybe he was a little overly aggressive, put some lives at risk as a result, he was unapologetic though, he felt if it was going to be a war of attrition, he was going to win it, and the results speak for themselves. In terms of his presidency, well, things are mixed in that regard. He did try and fought on the economic side to keep the nation uh, on, the, on the sound currency basis, and he was successful there. His other efforts with the Indians and black populations, a lot of effort in the first term, kind of waned in the second term. He certainly tried hard more than any other post, uh, post-war post president really to help the freedmen in, in the South as well as the Indians. But again, the momentum was against him. And by the end of the second term, a lot of that had, had sort of gone away. He was a unifying force. Uh, for the country, both during the war and after. He was also flawed. He made mistakes. He was far too trusting. He had all those scandals in the second term, so he wasn't perfect. He was an American hero. That's no question. He fell short in some areas. That's true, too. That doesn't diminish the service he provided to his country in the most perilous time the country had ever faced. That is Ulysses Grant, world traveler, bankruptcy, and memoir. From the life of Ulysses Grant, for more presidential chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.